Good morning, Grace Point Church. Welcome. We're so glad you guys are here. Let's stand and join in worship together. You may be seated. I want to welcome you briefly. We're so glad that you are with us this morning, joining us. Uh, apparently, you got the memo of our special service arrangement this morning as we will have a business meeting following this service at 1030. So I want to continue to just extend an invitation to hang around and be a part of that with us. 
Um, and then uh, following the, the, the business meeting or, or kind of following it, we're going to have a real special dedication of this beautiful gift, this piano that the Lord has given our church. So uh, once our business meeting wraps up, we're going to transition right into a beautiful uh, concert. Jason's uncle's a concert pianist, going to be playing some beautiful music, some songs we'll sing to. Just be about a half an hour. Uh, <clears throat> so we really would love for you to be a part of that time as well. Um, as we enter into this worship uh, and this time together this morning, let me just invite you to consider with me this question this morning. Let's take a look at the screen. The question is, how many persons are there in God? So let's reflect upon this and read this with me, church. Let's read together. There are three persons in the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. While the term Trinity doesn't appear in the scriptures, it's how we describe our God who reveals himself in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, always present, immutable, they do not change, and each one has a unique role. We see the three-in-one, the triunity at creation, where God says, let us make man in our image. We see the triunity at the baptism of Jesus, when the Spirit of God de descended upon the Son of God in the form of a dove. And the voice of God the Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we receive the authority of the triunity in our mission to the world. In Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father is our creator who called creation good. And in his hands rests control of the universe and every aspect of our life. The Father oversees all circumstances so that everything can be used for our good. The Son is our Savior. Jesus Christ became fully man while remaining fully God. He came to earth and died on the cross to, to pay the penalty of our sin. And today Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit is our helper who resides within every believer at the moment of salvation. And from the Spirit we receive comfort and counsel, spiritual gifts, and the power to carry out the work that the Father has called us to do. And together, God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit love you perfectly, and they meet all of your needs. They work together to complete our marvelous salvation. The Son justifies you, the Spirit sanctifies you, and the Father glorifies you. No matter where you are in your spiritual journey today, you can turn to our triune God for love, protection, guidance, and salvation. Let's read this passage together, this one verse, in fact, 2 Corinthians 13. Let's read together, church. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we love you. We are grateful for the incredible revelation. You are a marvelous God. And in this, and in this way, you represent yourself to us, what we call a trinity. We, we behold your, your marvelous power and beauty, realizing that in this revelation, you are unlike anything else. There is no other God. And so we worship you. And we rightly give back to you the, the praise that you are worthy to receive. Thank you for this salvation that is at work in us and the spirit of God that is given to us as a pledge that we become sons and daughters of the King. And so, Jesus, we are going to spend time now lifting up our voices to you, worshiping you, giving thanks and praise in our hearts for what you have done for us. We trust that you will receive these things. And as we also receive our morning offerings, we do so to give back to you with grateful hearts for all that you've done, recognizing that you're a provider of all things. You will always sustain and meet our every need. And we are so blessed to be a part of the ministry that is at work in this church. So in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. And all of God's people said.
sits on heaven's mercy seats. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Join us in worship.
Father, all the glory is yours. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and worship God as one body. Under your name, Father, by your power and by your spirit. Lord, just be speaking through Jared. Allow what you have for us this morning, God, to be heard. Father, you're so worthy of all our praise. We thank you, Lord. Just bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Amen. Thank you, team. Uh, great.
great to worship with you this morning, church. I want to take a moment to dismiss what we call our point seekers. This is today for pre-K through fifth grade. For those interested, we have an opportunity for some continued fellowship and, and learning, and there'll be help for them outside of the doors if uh, they want to be released at this time. Um, and also just want to draw your attention quickly to the screen, just a couple of things to highlight for you as we enter into the Word. I even encourage you to grab your Bibles now if you'd like. If you don't, there's some in the racks below you as we turn to Romans 2. But if you take a look at the screen, there's a, a few um, events that are coming up. We want to just throw these in front of you so you see what's happening in the next week or two, just to make a note of those events or activities that might be most relevant to you. Um, as you'll see, we got uh, for men an important opportunity next weekend, uh, a, a, really a conference, but being hosted here that we're going to be watching as it takes place in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, and also just want to draw your attention, especially to that baptism class. So uh, on February 4th and February 11th, during our Sunday school hour, there's going to be a special opportunity. I'm going to be leading a class on what is baptism, the significance of it, and why we do it as a, as a part of our confession of faith as believers. So if that's something you're interested in, want to know more about, um, please contact the office. Otherwise, just uh, we'll be uh, participating in that during the Sunday school hour up here in our conference room, and they can get more information as well online. And so just want to note that on February 25th, uh, we will be having a baptism service here at, on a Sunday morning. And so uh, beyond the class, if anyone is interested in knowing more about it or has been considering those, uh, that step of faith in your life, uh, again, we'd love to hear from you, talk with you. You can contact our office. And as always, friends, just want to draw your attention following the services at, at, in the afternoon at 12. We always put out what we call Connection Point. It's an email that contains all of this information, and you can find out more there. So just be attentive to that. Well, let's, uh, again, open up our Bibles and join with me on Romans chapter 2. You know, if you think about it, all of life is a series of doing things to get something. It's all about doing something to get something. I mean, from the time we are born to the time that we die, we, we live in this larger narrative that you have to do something in order to achieve something. And, and to help illustrate that point, let me just give, you, give us a few examples starting from the very beginning. Potty training, right? I mean, to go from diapers to undies. I mean, to, to achieve that step in life, we have to do something. What? successfully go to the toilet on our own. And we might get added incentives like M&Ms or stickers, but we're trying to do something to get something. As we progress later in life, it might be things like school or sports. In both of those things, we are doing something like our homework and achieving these things so we can achieve the movement to the next grade level. Or in sports, we're putting in the practice, we're doing something so we can achieve and earn a spot on the team or, or time playing on the court or field. So we study to graduate, we graduate to get a job, we, we work in that job, we do something in order to hopefully achieve a, a raise or a promotion, and all of this work typically builds to this, this life stage, this crescendo of retirement. But even then in retirement, we're often doing something, we're trying to fill our time so we can receive something like a sense of value and purpose and satisfaction. All of life is a series of doing something to earn something. It's true in our relationships. Like I had to do something in relationship to my wife to achieve like her hand in marriage. I had to do something to get something. And so how many of you have heard the expression, all truth is God's truth? Have you ever heard that expression? Well, this is certainly the case with our experiences in life. So in the same way, our life is dictated by doing things to get things. This same truth applies to the standards of God and his judgment over all of life. You see, the Bible makes it plainly known that when all is said and done, when all is said and done, we are gonna stand before his throne in judgment. And everything is gonna boil down to our deeds, the things that we did with the life that we lived. And it's why if you've been a part of the, the, the confession of faith in the church and know your Bible long enough, we all sit here and we long to hear the words from our master on that day. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. And if you know the context of that expression, you were given a few things and you did something with it. You achieved. Now come and, and enjoy the reward of, of your father, your master's rest. Now, th this is uh, an important part of Scripture. And like the tip of an iceberg, I'm going to give you just a few, 
uh, references to illustrate further this point. Um, and so just a sum on the screen, but just to highlight a few, though valuable nonetheless, like Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the conscience, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his, what? Doings. Isaiah 3, verse 10 and 11 says, Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. Woe to the wicked. It will go badly with him, for what he deserves will be done to him. 2 Corinthians 5.10, the apostle Paul writes, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Jesus in Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his, what? Deeds. We know certainly Genesis 6, 7, Galatians 6, 7, for what a person reaps, they, a person sows, they will also reap. All right, so this ongoing rhythm of doing something to receive something. So join with me as we look at Romans 2. Our passage this morning is verses 6 through 10 specifically. Our sermon is titled, All That Will Be Judged. Yeah, to pull us back from last week just a little bit, we saw in verse 5, if you take a look, that we are storing up wrath for ourselves, that, that there, is, there is the righteous judgment of God. Verse 6, who will render to each person according to his deeds... To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. We'll spend more time in this next week, but then verse 11, there is no partiality with God. So here's the thing. I want to give you the main point of our passage at the very start. I want, I want to put in front of us at the very start the main point of this morning so that if you hear nothing else, you hear this, which I believe matters most from this text today. And here it is on the screen. Our salvation is not accomplished by our works. But by our works, we affirm our salvation. Everything else now this morning, from this text to my words, will just be fleshing out this great biblical truth that I want you to hold fast to this morning. Now, if you were with us last week, you may recall my emphasis that how we read and study the Bible has profound implications for how we apply the Bible. And our passage today offers another important lesson to this very principle. As we continue now through chapter 2, we find ourselves, and now this is the context, where do we find ourselves in Paul's letter? We are right in the middle of what is Paul's first main section to the Romans. In other words, everything that we are reading in this letter is designed to uphold and support Paul's main point, his thesis. And his thesis has been given to us, we've maybe learned this by now, in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Everything in this letter is about this one point, that the just shall live by faith according to the gift of God's righteousness that has been revealed to you. And along with this important context is now the author's intent. What is Paul by way of the Holy Spirit? In other words, what is God wanting us to know? Well, Paul is intending to emphasize the marvelous goodness of God through the gift of his righteousness. And so he shows us this goodness, God's goodness, by setting it against the backdrop of God's just wrath and condemnation for our sins. It's why Paul jumps right into Romans 1.18 after saying the just will live by faith. This gift of righteousness is given to you. It's as if Paul's saying, now appreciate that. Embrace that and celebrate that. Why? Because now the first main section of his letter, of which we are right in the middle of it, Paul says in Romans 1.18, because the wrath of God is also revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. So therefore, it's as if Paul's saying, isn't God good to give you his righteousness? 
So what our passage today demonstrates is that all of our actions, all of our works produce a final outcome according to the judgment of God. We see in Romans 2, like verse 2, that God's judgment is always right. It's, it's always true. We're going to see this a lot more next week as we study just verse 11, but God's judgment is also impartial. He's not biased. We, we are not judged, for instance, on the basis of our national identity. We can't sit back and take comfort in the fact, well, you know, I, I live in a predominantly Christian nation. And we all know that ship sailed a long time ago, but some people might say that. And as we work our way backwards throughout human history, a lot of places might have claimed that at one point or another. Well, don't you know where I'm from? And certainly in Paul's case, as he's writing this letter, it was the Jews who especially wanted to take a source of pride on the fact that, don't you recognize my national identity? Obviously, that covers everything, and God doesn't judge on the basis of our national identity. We're not judged on the basis of our family. Well, I grew up in a Christian home. Don't you know my grandma and grandpa are saints in the church, and they pray for me all the time? And we can take a sort of comfort. We, we can seek to justify ourselves because of these types of standards or, or experiences. But we're not judged on the basis either of a prayer that we prayed or whether or not we attend church or we're members. No, we will be judged according to the things we did with the life that we lived. Paul says very clearly in verse 6, to each person, each person, God will judge. Verse 9, every soul of man. So on these very grounds, what grounds? That God is the standard, that he is holy, and that he is right and good and pure. On these grounds, we will be judged by our works and our works left to ourselves. And it's the only thing that we have to approach God with. On these grounds, our works will always judge us as worthy of condemnation. That's why the Bible says in Isaiah 64 that all of our deeds are like a filthy rake. In the eyes, in the eyes, his standards of a holy God. You see, it doesn't matter, as Paul's going to argue, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you are self-righteous or immoral. It doesn't matter if you are better than the person next to you. This was the attitude of judgment we talked about a couple of weeks ago. For a lot of us, we want to justify ourselves and to find a measure of comfort by pointing to another and saying, well, I'm not as bad as that person is. And we seek to justify ourselves by saying, well, yeah, you know, I think I'm pretty good, actually. But this is not what we are judged by. We will be judged, each one of us individually and our works, we will be judged according to God's holiness. Not if you are better than the next person. And according to that, we will always be judged as worthy of condemnation. This judgment from God is revealed against us because as we saw last week in verse 5, we are storing up wrath for ourselves. Do you remember that, church? Take a look there at verse 5, storing up wrath. What does that mean, storing up? Let me just quick reminder. It's like, it's like a deposit in your bank account. And all it takes is like a penny. And there's an account that is attributed to your name. And just one sin has stored up an account in your life, an account of judgment. And nothing we do can ever withdraw that account and make it even again. We can't do anything to take that out. We are storing up. And so as we live our lives, we are storing up more and more deposits into this account in which God's wrath will be against us. This is why verse 3 of chapter 2, we cannot escape the judgment of God. And this is true for all of us. All of us. Doesn't matter if you're raised in the church, born in a Christian home, lived in America, whatever excuses you want to come up with, it's true for all of us. We are storing up wrath. Why? This is Paul's argument. We're storing up wrath by the nature of our heart. This is our ungodliness. <clears throat> and we are storing up wrath by the conduct <clears throat> of our lives. Excuse me. That worship was good. I was singing this morning. Anyone else singing? Amen. You see, all of us, all of us, not, not, not them, like we point to a couple weeks ago, not them, the, the last half of chapter one, all of us are guilty, Paul says in Romans 1, 
we are guilty of exchanging the glory of God for lesser things. This is how we're storing up wrath. And by lesser things, not necessarily unimportant things, but just lesser things. Because we remove God from the position that he deserves to be at, and we look at other things as being that which gives us what we think we need. It could be things like money. We can look at money, and you know we're not worshiping the dollar bill. That's silly. Anybody would say that's the most foolish thing to think. We're like bowing down and worshiping a dollar bill. But that dollar bill, as an example, is like a conduit to something else, and it's that which we are worshiping. That the dollar can represent a sense of security or comfort or influence or power. And, and so that's why we give it a kind of allegiance and affection to these things. Maybe that conduit is a person. We look to a person other than God to be the source. of. We may not be worshiping the person, but we are in a way giving affection and attention to what that person might give. A sense of fulfillment. They can make me happy. They can keep me protected. They can give me what I need. Maybe it's material things like cars or homes. But all of these things represent the lesser things that aren't God himself. We can also be guilty of exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And what do I mean? Well, the lie, for instance, that we're maybe not as bad as we think we are. And when we minimize the truth of who we really are, we are also minimizing the reality of God's holiness. So look at how Paul concludes. Again, here is the context. Look at how Paul concludes this first main section, a section that runs from chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. No one can live a perfectly pure, moral, obedient life according to the standard of God. That's, that's what Paul's saying. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Paul says elsewhere, like in Galatians chapter 3, that the, the value of the law is that it's like a tutor. It is teaching you your need, and so therefore it points you to Christ. The law's value is it makes plainly known to us that despite what we think about ourselves, it's not according to another person, but according to God. And on that ground, we will be judged. And so all of this background is necessary to support, again, my main point, to return to what this passage is all about, that our salvation is not accomplished by our works, but by our works, we affirm our salvation. You see, when Paul says that we will be judged by our deeds in verse 6, Paul is not contradicting himself when he said the just shall live by faith. It's easy to read verse 6 and think, Paul, you just told me in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, that you've given me a righteousness that I have in faith. It's not like Paul, 20-some verses later, just completely lost his mind and forgot what he was talking about. What is the context? What is the intent of the author? Nor is Paul contradicting himself when later in chapter 3, verse 24, he will tell us that we are justified counted worthy and accepted in the eyes of God by his free grace. No, Paul is affirming the truth of God's revelation that our works will judge us. He is absolutely affirming that which scripture has made plainly known. But here's the deal. Our works will always show one of two things, either a life of godliness or a life of selfishness. We might put it this way, our life will ultimately reveal a self-centeredness or a Christ-centeredness. So Jesus illustrates this very truth. For instance, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 17, Jesus explaining to his disciples, how would we know whether someone's a good teacher or a false teacher? And Jesus simply says this in chapter 7, uh, 17, Jesus says, so every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. This is an appropriate form of judgment. It is a biblical discernment to, dis, to, to, to discover the difference between right and wrong. And Jesus is saying here, you will know them by their fruits. Think of an apple tree. Who doesn't love apples, right? The apple itself is not the source of life. It's the, it's the taste, it's the product of the source of life, which is the, the roots of the tree that are going down deep into the soil. This is why Paul elsewhere, like in Colossians 2, verse 6, talks about that we are to plant ourselves firmly in Christ. He is the source that, that we get our life from. The apple is just the evidence, the taste of the life itself. So when we look back to verse 6, 
here of chapter two, Paul says that God is going to render. What does that word mean? To, to render means to pay as a wage, to pay as a wage. Anybody ever get a paycheck from work before? Your employer is rendering you for the service that you have given. And so God is going to judge us with a payment for the work that we have done. Now, this payment is going to come, Paul says, in the form of either eternal life with God or wrath and indignation apart from God. This is an eternal matter between heaven and hell, glory and distress. And what is important here, and I want to make sure we place a, pay close attention to this, is the emphasis upon our seeking. If you look there at verse 7, in doing good, seek. Paul uses the word seeking. If you look with me at verses 7 and 9. First, verse 7, Paul says this, to those who by perseverance in doing good, seek. See that word there? Seek for glory and honor and immor immorality, eternal life. Verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. What are we being judged by? We are being judged by our efforts, by our work, by the things that we do. It's an expression of intentionality. Paul is choosing to use the words perseverance, and as we see there in verse 8, selfish ambition. You see, in the Greek word, the word doing means labor, toil, work. It's a strong word. It's definitely not a passive word. We are putting our effort into either one of two things. We are either doing things for God or things that are selfishly ambitious. But the point in all of this is in regards to what we are seeking. In other words, there is something inside of us that is driving us towards either one of two conclusions. You see, Paul is not implying here that our works save us, but he is making clear that our work defines us. Again, it's like, what kind of tree are you? Are you a good tree producing good fruit or a bad tree producing bad fruit? What, what is the fruit of your life and, and what is growing at the ends of the branches of your life that represent the kind of soil or the kind of tree that you are? Our works are important. Our works matter to God because our works will be the evidence of what resides within our heart. In James 2, verse 17, we see an important distinction between our life of faith and the way that our faith demonstrates life. James says this, that even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. In John chapter 6, Jesus is preaching to the crowd of 5,000, and the people ask Jesus a question I think all of us would want to ask ourselves. What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Well, what should we do? And Jesus answers them, this is the work of God. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. This brings now clarity. It's bringing further clarity to Paul's argument in verses 6 and 7. Our deeds will judge us, or might say that God will bring judgment according to our deeds. But I want you to notice this important distinction. And I realize it's small, but it's important. Paul is not saying that we will be judged on the basis of our deeds or because of our deeds. Paul is saying that we will be judged according to our deeds. What are our deeds representing as a result of the life that resides within you? And this really ties back into verse 7 and Paul's emphasis upon our perseverance. This perseverance is not something we seek after on our own so we can gain God's approval or somehow get to and earn our salvation. Friends, if we could earn our salvation, God would give it to us freely. If we could live as he lives, then according to his righteous judgment, we could be saved by our works. But the point that Paul is stressing to us once again is our total dependency on the grace of God and on his revealed righteousness for us. And why? Because we are storing up wrath. 
because God's holiness is revealed against us. And as a result of that, we see in our own lives the fact that we are guilty of exchanging his glory for lesser things. We are guilty of exchanging his truth for a lie. And as a result, like it says in chapter 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. So like the law that is a tutor pointing us to Christ, being dependent on our works alone, we come to the harsh realization that on our own, we will be judged accordingly. And apart from Christ, we will be left wanting. God will judge our works. But without Christ and his work set upon our hearts, we will never measure up to the standard of God. This is Paul's point. He wants us to weigh the serious matter of our works so that we treasure Christ all the more in our hearts. Now this brings us back to the word perseverance. When we persevere, we are not working hard to achieve God's grace. No, when we persevere, we are steadfastly enduring by God's grace. It is Christ who is at work within us to produce a lifestyle of godliness. Let me just take us to another passage by Paul to help prove this point that our works and our perseverance is a product of the power of God at work within us. On the screen, I'm gonna show you Colossians 1, verses 22, 21 to 23. Paul writes this, and although you were formally alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, in other words, he's describing the Romans one person. He's describing the judgment that we all face. We are all storing up this condemnation. Yet, Paul says, now he has reconciled you in his body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue, there's that word persevere. If indeed you persevere in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, your life will tell a story. And it's a story that doesn't deserve your glory. It's a story that deserves all of his glory. Your steadfast faithfulness will be a testimony to the watching world that there is something unique and different and why you are set apart because you possess the grace of God. And only by his power, this power that is a power of God for salvation, Paul says in Romans 1.16, to all who believe. And that is what the world will see. It can't be any clearer than this, friends. God is going to judge us according to our works. But our works are going to judge the condition of our heart. That's what matters most. We might think of it as a question. Is our life positively demonstrating obedience to God? You see, in the evangelical church today, there is oftentimes two polarizing differences with how we view our works. On the one end of the spectrum, we can overemphasize our works, can't we? We can overemphasize our works and give so much value to our works that we see our works as necessary and required. And as a result, we can create a false understanding that our works are necessary for salvation. This is what we call a works-based righteousness, and it's a heresy that many people can fall into. Now, on the other end of the spectrum is what we call antinomianism. I know it's a fancy word. Don't worry about it today. But that fancy word can be explained really by Paul in Romans 6.1. What is the attitude that many can have towards their works? Paul says, well, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? What is Paul saying? Should we just continue to live however we want with no regard whatsoever to the quality or the fruit that our life is producing? It doesn't really matter. God's grace is just going to cover it all anyway. You see, antinomianism says that God does not require a believer to obey the moral law. Let's say, for example, like the Ten Commandments. In its most extreme and perverted form, antinomianism permits immoral behavior based on the grace of God. So you have this spectrum. Either we elevate our works to such a place that we are dependent on them for our salvation, or we reduce the value of our works 
to the extent that we reject them altogether and live lives of reckless abandonment, believing that God's grace will just cover it all. And what our passage affords us this morning is the necessary and appropriate middle ground. It is necessary, friends. Church, it is necessary to evaluate our lives, to evaluate the condition of our heart based on the choices we make and the actions that we take. What do our lives reveal? What is the fruit that is being produced? What is the watching world observing? What are your family members, children, and grandchildren watching? Is your life giving evidence to the fact that at some point when you were a kid, you said a prayer, but then misunderstood the importance of how God sees our work and you just lived a life of reckless abandonment? Is that life testifying to the goodness and grace of God? Or is that life abusing the goodness and grace of God? What are we showing with our works? What do our lives reveal about the hope and the power of the gospel? It is also appropriate, church, to consider the holy standard of God. It is necessary for us to evaluate and consider the scriptures and what it says about God and what God has revealed about himself to be true and to determine if your life is being lived with him in mind. God is going to judge everything, friends, because everything is going to reflect one simple truth. Everything will reflect one simple truth. Did you live for God or did you live for yourself? Our team's gonna come up and lead us in a final song. And as they do, I want to leave us with this beautiful encouragement. <clears throat> I've stressed the main point twice now, but God's word says it all. In Ephesians 2.10, Paul writes, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Created in Christ Jesus. He is the source of our salvation. He is the giver of our life. He has redeemed us, not on the basis of deeds that we have done in righteousness, because those are like a filthy rag in the eyes of God when that's the only thing we're giving back to God. But when we give back to God a heart of faith, the just shall live by faith, and the spirit and the power of God resides and takes residence in our life, that's the spirit of repentance that we talked about. It is the power of God that radically changes the mind to think differently about who we are and more importantly, to think differently about who God is. And when we understand the enormity and the beauty and the grace of God and what he would give to you when we did not deserve it, God proved his love for us and he gave us his son even while we were still sinners. We respond to that work of righteousness and we can't help but to continue to live, live for his glory and his honor. As verse 7 says, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. God has prepared these things beforehand that we would walk in them. It is all by God. It is all for God. To God be the glory. And thanks be to Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Would you join with me and let's stand together in song. Deliver us from the Lord, we sojourn
temptation crouching at the door to turn us from the from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus, our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you and encourage you as you live to work for the things of God, seeking his glory in honor in all things, because because of what he has done in you. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again back in a half an hour as we start our business meeting at 1030. You are dismissed.